Okay, we've talked about all the actions. Now let's talk about the defender attributes. So I'll show you where those are on the counter. Um, attributes are found in the exact same lo location as the actions. So here we have an exam example of an attribute, the O. And we'll talk about each one of these attributes. Um, but that's where you can find them on the counters. So the first attribute we're going to talk about, the first couple, are related to morale. So the first one we'll talk about is the low morale attribute, and it's represented by the M for morale. This attribute is, um, you can find that on all five of the regular uh, German army uh, riflemen, the five riflemen that use the same counter. So this, this attribute is actually inspired by a real event that took place during the battle where one of the um, German riflemen uh, actually left the battle, fled the battle, and pre presumably um, joined the SS attackers. That That's not confirmed, but that was what the suspicion was at the time. So, in gameplay, how this actually happens is, if there's a location, so for example, we're going we're gonna to look at this location um, as an example here. If there's a location where any defender in the location becomes a casualty, and how that happens, we'll explain in the SS cars. There's a couple of different ways in which a defender can become a casualty. But regardless of how it happens, if it happens, if a defender becomes a casualty, let's say Pollock does. Pollock becomes a casualty, gets removed from the board. Then any rifleman inside the same location, um, when a casualty occurs, will flee because they have this low morale. Now, from a point scoring perspective, they're counted as casualties, meaning they would count a point against you at the end of the game. So, because a because Pollock was a casualty and they were in the location, they immediately fled. Okay, that seems a bit harsh. Um, there's a way to get around it, and that's the next attribute. So, we'll, we'll just put them back for now. Um, but in that case, had Pollock become a casualty, that's what would happen. So, let's look at some other locations where the riflemen are located. So we have this location here, um, and let's go through it. Let's say Gengel is a casualty. So he gets uh, hit by a sniper. He's a casualty. He's removed from the game. Now, under the situation I just described, we have this rifleman here with the morale, uh, low morale attribute. He would flee, right? But um, but let's take a closer look. So Gengel is, is sniped and removed. However, we have a German officer here who has the O, and O stands for uh, Wehrmacht Officer. So he, this ability, this attribute rather, uh, specifically just offsets the low morale. So basically if you have a German regular army officer in place at the location, the same location as a rifleman, he's going to offset the low morale of the, officer, of the, of the rifleman. So he would actually have prevented the, the rifleman from running away when Gangle became the, um, the casualty, became a casualty. And that would be the same in these other situations here we've got. So if if Schrader, for instance, was a casualty, this Wehrmacht officer would prevent this rifleman from fleeing. However, if the situation had been that the officer became a casualty, then the rifleman would have fled because no one here would have had the Wehrmacht officer um, attribute. Okay, so that's the um, the two attributes related to morale. Now let's talk about the other two attributes. So one is tank crew, and as you can imagine, these these are for the defenders specifically related to Basat and Jenny. So all of the Basat and Jenny operators have the tank crew um, attribute, as well as one other defender, and it's the lieutenant uh, base here. Now. He has, he's actually not part of Basat and Jenny's tank crew. He was a tank commander from a different tank that was uh, left behind during the, the journey there. But regardless, he shares the tank crew attribute because he could also, he's obviously also proficient with the tank. So what does the tank crew attribute provide? It allows defenders to use any of these special, um, the special text they're in these designated squares, any square that has the T at the end of the text. So essentially it's these four squares, these four combat positions in Visat and Jenny, plus this one in the gatehouse. So I'll briefly cover what these what these do. Um, I'll, I'll touch on these bottom three here because they're basically the same. So these two 
spaces correlate to the 30 cows that were in Basat and Jenny. So if a, a defender is here and they have the T for tank crew as an attribute, they can take their action to attack or suppress and use the values here instead. So they can attack with a two and suppress with a three instead of their normal attributes. Here at the 50 cal, they could attack with a two and suppress with a four. So you would just take the action just like normal. You would just say, okay, Lee is going to attack. So he's gonna flip over, take the attack action. Okay, so now let's talk about the 76 millimeter cannon. So the load position here, first of all, you'll note that it has no line of sight. It's white, so it has no line of sight to anything. So you, if, you're, if a defender is in this position, they cannot attack or suppress. The only thing they can do is load. So they would take a load action. You just take the load token and you put it here. And that mark, that designates the fact that the 76 millimeter cannon has been loaded. And then if you want to take an action with the gunner, you can take that action and you can either attack using the four attack value or suppress using seven suppress. So for example, let's just say we're suppressing. We would spin the load token get rid of it, and we would take seven suppress tokens if we had them here and place them in gray, because Poseidon Jenny is going to be um, targeting gray and suppressing against gray. So those are the um, tank crew spaces. Now you may be wondering why there's a tank crew space here. That's because the 30 cal that was in the um, assistant driver's spot on Poseidon Jenny was removed from Poseidon Jenny and placed in the gatehouse. Okay, so the last attribute is the reinforcement attribute. So that for that, we need to go back to the three reinforcement defenders we took out of the beginning of the game. So this entire time, they've been sitting on the side waiting to come and join the battle. The way that happens is probably about halfway through the SS deck, as you're playing the game, you're going to flip over and you're going to find the one card that's not related to the SS. And this is reinforcement card. And it says, add defenders with reinforcement attribute designation to your supply. And that counts as one of your SS cards. So that's going to be a great turn for you because you only have to deal with three. So immediately you'll take the three reinforcements. You'll add them to your supply. They can be played at any point in the game. Now, you can play them just like you did earlier when you placed the other defenders for the first time. So for example, let's say you want to play um, Waddle, um, the Austrian resistance member. It's got an MP40, you know, pretty good uh, good uh, capability to suppress there. Not a bad guy to have. You just, as an action, you just take them, place them, and then go ahead and do whatever action you want to, just like normal. The one difference between these three defenders and placing the others at the beginning of the game is you're not required to ever place these. So unlike at the beginning of the game where you had to play the 25 defenders uh, immediately before you could take any other action, if you chose to, you could just ignore these reinforcements. They don't have to go to a specific location and you don't have to play them. So those are the four defender attributes.